Well, good morning again. And let me remind you of another announcement. I really need photos from years ago. Church was started in 1897, so any of you have any photos from then, let me know. Send them to me. Uh, otherwise, just send me what you have. Something really great that maybe uh, captures four or five of the folk. And uh, we're going to show these during our Back to the Future event in September. They'll just run constantly, and you'll get to see some of the great people who have gone before you, and in addition to some of the great people right now who are serving the church in such a, a mighty way. We're going to continue with our new series today called Guiding Principles. And, and these are messages that have influenced me probably more than they've influenced you. Back in 1975, Howard Snyder published a book called The Problem with Wineskins. It absolutely challenged all the churches in America to rethink who they are. Well, it was just recently reprinted again because guess what? It is even more relevant today than it was 40 couple year ago. It comes from a parable that Jesus spoke. And a lot of people misunderstand it. So, well, here it is. I'm, I'm just going to read it to you as Jesus said. He said, no one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskin will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Now, before we even get started, I want you to look at this picture here. Because these days, wine comes in a bottle or a box from the grocery store. <clears throat> but in the days of Jesus, it was often stored in a wineskin. Now, the idea is pretty easy. You take a goat skin, you wash it out, you close up the feet and the tail, you leave the neck open, and there you go. You have a wine skin. When they're brand new, they're soft, they're limber. You can almost use it as a pillow to sleep on if you wanted to. You know what I'm saying? But after a while, they get old. They, they get stiff. Uh, they get brittle, and they eventually crack and break. Now, so what in the world is Jesus talking about? You have to go back to the context. That's kind of the rule for any kind of Bible study. You want to understand one verse, you need to see how it fits into all the other verses around it. Well, here's the background to that parable. Some critics of Jesus come up to him, and they say, John's disciples, John the Baptist, they often fast and pray. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. In other words, they're saying, hey, if you're such a great religious teacher, why don't your disciples keep all the traditions of the Jewish faith? And so Jesus responds, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. All right, a little background to that. In the days of Jesus, a marriage celebration lasted for seven days. In other words, if you went to somebody's wedding, you planned on being there for seven days in a row, okay? They loved to party. And they had a tradition, a custom, that said when you are in a wedding celebration, you don't have to follow these rules about fasting and all this. And so Jesus is simply saying, look, guys, I'm here. I'm here and now with my believers, my disciples. We're in this wedding celebration. They don't have to fast. But one day when I'm gone, they'll fast. 
And, and by the way, this isn't the first time people complain about Jesus. They constantly complain that he does not keep the rules of the ancient Jewish faith. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Well, Jesus replied, well, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? And then in another place, some of the Pharisees asked, what? why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? What was he doing? Healing people, making the sick get better, but they didn't like that. It was this fact that Jesus didn't keep all of these traditions that made the people so mad at him. That's why the Jewish leaders hated Jesus. Because, you, know, you see, for them, it was all about the outward stuff. It was about the rules or the regulations or the rituals. They didn't realize what well, we now know, that religion is a matter of the heart. It's internal. So Jesus now gives these two illustrations in a, a parable. And a parable is just a story that Jesus tells to prove a point. First one's common sense, okay? We, we get this one. You don't rip a piece of cloth off of a brand new garment and sew it on an old worn out garment. It's going to look stupid, and then you have totally ruined a brand new garment. That makes sense. We get that one. It's this other one that sort of bogs our brain a little today. He says, you don't pour new wine into old wineskins. If you do that, the wineskin will burst, the wine will go on the ground, and nobody's going to be happy. I learned this as a little baby. Well, I don't know about the yay high like this. A few of you know my mother, met her before she passed. She was an absolute saint, incredible lady. But one of the many life lessons she taught me was to not tighten the lids on wine bottles while they're fermenting. You ever seen those antique cabinets that have metal instead of glass? They call them pie safes. Anybody seen one? Wow, am I the only one who remembers those things? <laughs> well, well, my mother was making a batch, as they say, and she learned the hard way that you have to live, leave the lid loose. You can't tighten it up. We were sitting there. I was just a little lad. Boom! <laughs> there blew out one of those metal panels. And I went, do it again, do it again! <laughs> Boom! <laughs> there went out the other metal panel. Yay, yay! <laughs> Nevertheless, she was not as happy as I was that day. And she spent probably the next week cleaning up dandelion juice from all over the kitchen. Now, believe it or not, that's the point Jesus is making. Wine has to be allowed to age in new wineskins. Because when nature starts working and that gas starts expanding, the wineskin is going to expand. And it's got to be young and loose and flexible because if it's old. And that gas, is carbon dioxide, if it, if it comes out, it's just going to break the wineskin in half and the, the good wine is going to fall on the ground. Plus your wineskin is destroyed. So we get it, I hope. New wine has to be put into new wineskins. <laughs> but what in the world does that mean? Well, that's the part that I think applies so much to us today. For Jesus, the wine represents everything he brought to this planet. Everything brand new. I mean... It wasn't that God gave a bad law back on Mount Sinai. It just wasn't meant to last forever. And so Jesus is coming now to get rid of what the Old Testament said, that every year we have to sacrifice to make God happy. 
Jesus now offers his life on the cross as the one and only sacrifice ever needed. <coughs> and then on top of that, over the years, the ancient Jews kept adding rules and rituals and regulations to everything God had added. So by the time of Jesus, it's a mess. The religion of the Jewish faith in the day of Jesus is old, it's broken, it's cold, it's stiff, it's formal, it's full of traditions and rituals and opinions that were never meant to have been there. And Jesus knew he was bringing something better into the world. And Jesus knew that if Christianity was going to grow and expand and change the world, it just could not operate within the confines of that old Jewish faith. And by the way, make no mistake, the enemies of Jesus completely understood what he was saying. They completely understood what he meant. That's why they put him on a cross. But understand the principle that Jesus is teaching. This new gospel of Jesus just cannot be placed in a system that's worn out, broken down, out of date. Well, that naturally brings us to the question of, well, why are you telling me this, Pastor? What does it have to do with us? As a church here, what does this mean for us? And the answer is exactly the same. The new gospel of Jesus cannot be placed in old, broken, worn-out traditions. Now, if you hate change, relax. The gospel of Jesus, this wine of Jesus, never changes. What it takes to become a Christian and remain a Christian, it has not changed since the first century. It's not going to change until Jesus comes. I mean, this, the beauty part of, of Jesus it stays constant, never changes. Uh, but the bad news, everything else in life changes. Everything else in life eventually has to be replaced. Remember this, though. A wineskin is there to protect and help the wine. Now, we say, what are you talking about? All right, well, let me give you a, an example. Worship. The, the new relationship we have with Jesus just makes us worship. Worship takes on all sorts of new dimensions and, and areas. But we still have traditions around worship. The times we meet, uh, the format of the service, the style of the music, or the instrument we play, or how we have a message, when we have a message. They're all part of the wineskins. They become part of the traditions that hold this beautiful concept that we need to worship God. Communion. Communion is the same way. It's part, it's how we remember what Jesus is bringing. But there's all sorts of traditions around communion, like when do we do it? How do we do it? Who can do it? When can we do it? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And all of those external traditions are wineskins. I, I, who would have ever thought that one day we would be taking communion with guys in masks and gloves? I, I'm pretty sure in a couple of years somebody is going to say that that's not scriptural because they didn't like it. But, I mean, it's just their wineskins. And remember, even today, people love to make rules that are just not part of that Bible. Huh. Now, I, I, I really do need to make a point here because I'm squeezing a lot in in a very short amount of time. Wineskins are not bad. Wineskins are not evil. Wineskins are good. They just wear out. And every once in a while, they have to be replaced. Let me give you some examples. When I was growing up as 10-year-old, 12-year-old, Every year we had vacation Bible school. It was two weeks long, and it started at 9 a.m. 
and went to 12 noon every year. Why don't we do that anymore? We had so much fun. <laughs> we don't do it anymore because everybody's working. All the kids are asleep and it just doesn't work anymore. It was a wineskin that worked for a while, but it ran out. I'll give you another one from in the years past. <laughs> How many of you remember a two-week revival? Yeah, not many of you. <laughs> Couple of you. Tiring, Tiring boy. <laughs> Every night for two weeks having a church service. Whew. Well, it was good for a while. It ran its course. It did its thing, but it doesn't function in this crazy world we live in these days. And even Sunday school is struggling all over the country and is probably going to be soon replaced by something else. Now, as a church, we have two choices. We can stubbornly just keep doing whatever we've been doing for the past 50 years, even if it don't work anymore. <coughs> or number two, we can replace it with something that works. You take the first choice, I guarantee you, your church will grow old, stagnant, and die. Why? Because the wine skid got hard, it became brittle, and the fresh wine that the church is serving is on the ground. Now, the second option is one of the worst, I don't want to say worst, but one of the most difficult jobs for a church to ever do. You know, because sometimes we just don't want to admit that our favorite little project isn't working. And sometimes it's hard to stop doing something that we love to do because we've done it for so long, even if it doesn't work anymore. You know, I look back on our church and our leaders and the people. We've, we've made a lot of changes. We've changed a, a lot of wineskins. There was a time people thought we were pretty traditional, and we were. Then there was a time people thought we were pretty non-traditional, and we were. But I tell you what, we're very traditional today. It just changed our traditions a little bit. Here's what I see, and I'll be honest with you. I think it's time that some of our wineskins be replaced. That's obviously what I'm suggesting. I think we have a challenge of two things. Number one, we have to keep the purity of the gospel, the wine. We need to be stressing the personal relationship we have with Jesus. His values, his morals, his ethics, his integrity in all we do. I mean, if we're followers of Jesus, then we really should act like Jesus. We need to live out the biblical doctrines of unity and love and purity and peace, giving and fellowship. One of the slogans we often say here is that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, that's it. That's the main thing. That's the main thing any church has to be doing is to be acting like Christ Jesus in, among all its people. But it's really easy to get bogged down in the externals, isn't it? The wineskin parts. That's why the first priority of the church has to be focusing in on core values of who we are. Now, here's the second part of that challenge. We need to be replacing some wineskins when they don't work anymore. Remember, wineskins are not meant to be eternal. They never were. When they wear out, they are meant to be replaced. Let me give you a great church growth principle I learned in seminary. When the horse is dead, dismount. <laughs> you learn weird things in seminary, but I've never forgotten that. When it doesn't work anymore, stop doing it. <laughs> Let me tell you, uh, again, another example, from, a true example, from a little church in Virginia. Uh, not many people, 20 or 30. And, and in the foyer, they built um, one of these mailboxes. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's 10 foot wide and 4 foot high. 
And it was all had these little tiny mail slots. And everybody in the, every family in the church got a little box. And it was kind of cute. It was kind of convenient because come Christmas time, you just bring the Christmas cards in for everybody and just throw them in there in the foyer because everybody had this little open mailbox. It's just a box with a little slot where you could just put things in a person's slot. Well, the little church started growing, and the new people got their little box, but they ran out of boxes. And after that, all the new people who came didn't get a little mailbox. And after a while, all the people who still had this, they became the special people. They had a mailbox. They were somebody in the church because they had a mailbox in the foyer. You were not quite as good as they were because you didn't have a little mailbox in the foyer. It began to hurt the church. And finally, it was either stop growing or tear down the mailbox. Fortunately, that little church did. But it's difficult. It really is. Every church has a system of, mail, of mailboxes, of wineskins. You know, we do too. We have our own particular way of doing things. We have our traditions. You just have to ask yourself, are they still working? And we need to spend less time worrying about the wineskins, more time worrying about the wine. We need to genuinely love each other, take care of each other, meet each other's needs, be there for each other, bring out the best in each other, tell others about Jesus. We need to be teaching our children what all this is about. All right, one last thought. What's it mean for you today? You know what it meant for Jesus? You know what he meant by it? You know what it means to us, whether we like it or not? It's, it's there, it's a, something, an issue we need to deal with. But what about you as a person? Tough times right now, they're difficult times. The economy's kind of tough. Politics has gone crazy. Moral and ethical problems are growing in every area of society right now. There's a huge uncertainty of purpose in our country. Relationships between people are crumbling. I mean, however you want to look at it, there's some serious, difficult times in our future. And now more than ever, if your faith is going to be of any value to you, it's got to be the real thing. It can't be a cheap imitation. So let me ask you a very difficult question. You can't answer it now, but I want you to stew on it. How much of your faith is centered around the pure wine, the pure gospel of Christ Jesus, and how much of it is centered around these external little things of church, the traditions, the wineskin? Can you even tell the difference? Well, that's a frightening question, isn't it? To suggest that maybe in our own lives, our relationship with God might be more about the wineskins than the real wine. Okay, there is a time and a place for tradition and systems and rituals, but they're going to change from time to time. We need to remember that life is not about the external. Life is about the internal. When we stop caring about each other, when we stop loving each other, stop protecting one another, the wine has been spilled. And we are no longer the church. The building may still be here, but we are not the church. And, and when love and unity becomes bickering, griping, backstabbing, the wine is on the ground. When all that matters is power and control, the wine is on the ground. And when running an organization is more important than meeting the needs of the people, the wineskin has ruined the wine. 
So I leave you with two final questions. They're on the screen. They're in your bulletin. And they're obviously something for you just to think about. In your life, the wineskin that you spend time on too much is what? The external part of church that you're just spending too much time of thinking about or worrying about, what is it? And the other side is that the wine is pure pureness of who Jesus is and what he expects. What, what are you missing? What needs to be more part of your life? I hope you stew on that, and I hope you always, as today, take any occasion to learn more about Jesus. Praise him, come on up, and share a final song this morning.